Good morning. So glad that you joined us for this time of worship at Bethel Presbyterian Church, where this morning we're going to look at perhaps the first letter of the New Testament, Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. Wow. Well, I can't wait for that. But for the first thing that we'd like you to do is stand up wherever you're at, sing as loud as you can as we sing this opening hymn of praise. Let's worship, everyone. Well, everybody, let's uh, join together now uh, and pray. Pray to God uh, for the beginning of this worship service, for the Lord to be with us as we worship together. Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day of worship that we set aside. And I do pray that each of us have been able to do exactly that, to set this time aside, to set this day aside, to have this time of Sabbath with you, to rest to rest in the knowledge of your son, Jesus, to rest in the deepening of our faith and our relationship with you, but just to rest and to have the Holy Spirit work in our hearts, work in our homes and our lives, 
as we worship you this morning. And by your Holy Spirit, O Lord, I pray that you would bind us together, whether we are in this sanctuary worshiping or if we are at home, but that we would feel connected to the one body of Christ here at Bethel and Reed Road, at Bethel Presbyterian Church, that no matter how far scattered we are, we are, we are bound together by you, O Lord, uh, in unity, in unity of faith, and we give thanks for that. Lord, forgive us and how we have, have missed the mark uh, and how we have sinned against you in and, and so many ways. But also convict our hearts and remind us that by placing a faith in you, that we stand forgiven, that we are made clean by, by the sacrifice of, of what you have done on that cross. And so let that be the thing that uh, emboldens us and gives us courage to, to live boldly amongst uh, unbelievers, amongst this world, to be the lights of your truth and of your grace, so that others may experience that same redemption. Again, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this day. I pray for our church to be able to really unplug and to listen and to worship you fully this morning. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. And now today is Communion Sunday, and hopefully you had a chance to pick up uh, some communion elements here at the church. If not, you can uh, gather those things up uh, together now. We'll do communion a little bit later in this worship service. Uh, and you can gather whatever you, you have at, at home, be it bread, be it juice, whatever it is that you need to do that to join with us, I'd invite you to do that. But part of our tradition here at Bethel is on Communion Sunday, we recite the Nicene Creed together. And so I'd invite you to do that with me now. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now I invite all the children to come together and gather around whatever screen you are watching this on as we bring up Ryan Potter, our Director of Family and Children's Ministries, for our children's message this morning. Let's continue to worship. Hello, everyone. This week we get to start a new series called Superfan. We get to learn the best ways to cheer each other on that we're told to do in the Bible and this week we get to read in Ephesians 4.32, learning all about being humble and kind. In the scripture it says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. This weekend, I don't know if any of you guys are super excited, but the Super Bowl is on. And so that means there's a lot of people who choose a team. They choose to go all out, they'll wear jerseys, and they'll maybe even paint their face, do all the crazy things to support their favorite team. With the sports team, we are super fans. We want what's best for them, especially for them to win. We show forgiveness by throwing on our jerseys the next weekend, even if the weekend before our team lost. This is the same way we should treat people around us. We should be their biggest fans. But how can we do this? We can show them just how much God loves them by showing them love. This also shows God how much we love him by loving his people. Forgiving when people let you down and helping when no one even asks. Now, friends, I encourage you to turn to someone next to you and tell them something kind. Great. Church, you are awesome, and God loves you so much, and I am so glad you're watching. Let's pray. 
God, thank you for the ways you've created us. God, thank you for the ways that we get to experience your love because we have friends and people around us who show us just how much you love us and the ways that they love us. God, we just pray that we are able to be each other's super fans, that we just encourage each other and love one another so, so, so well because that's what you did for us. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Well, my friends, we have lots of fun things happening here at the church. One uh, is going to happen right after this uh, worship service. And so if you're worshiping at home, you should have received a Zoom invitation to participate in our congregational meeting that is going to occur, to occur roughly around 12 noon, 12, 15, uh, just uh, around that 12 noon time, uh, sign on and we will admit you in for our congregational meeting. And so please make sure that you can take part in that as well. Other fun things that are happening are happening uh, within our Next Gen Ministries. We are going to be sending out uh, boxes to families, families with children and families with students. It's our Lenten box. And in that box is going to be a lot of fun things, interactive things that you can do together as a family all Lenten season long even a devotional that will follow along with our sermon series, the High Priestly Prayer, that you can do uh, with your kids, with your teens, at the dinner table. And there's other fun interactive things in that box as well. So be on the lookout for that. We will be actually delivering them to your house in person. Can't wait for you to see what we have for you uh, in those Lenten boxes. For student ministries coming up uh, this Sunday is the Super Bowl. So today, the Super Bowl is happening. And so we are inviting any teenagers for students or student youth group to come up and have a watch party for the Super Bowl starting at 6 o'clock till whenever. You can come, cheer on your favorite team, and enjoy uh, all those things and some food and refreshments. Uh, so uh, be, uh, be uh, excited for that to happen later on this evening. The students are also going to do something fun on Monday, February 15th, which is President's Day, and that is they are going to go uh, on a day trip uh, to Mad River Mountain for skiing. And so if you are a teenager and you are uh, interested in that, or if you have a teenager that's interested in that, contact Jordan Crawford at the email listed below and sign up for that fun event. Uh, lastly, that I have for you is our... Um, for young adults, see all under next gen. But on young adult, for our young adult ministries on Friday, February 19th at 7.30 p.m., we are going to have a worship night right here in our sanctuary. We ask that everyone still stay masked and we'll have you socially distanced within this uh, sanctuary. But we're gonna have a young man leading worship with us and just have a time together. And so if you are a young adult, 18 to 30 something, or if you know of anyone else in that age group, or even if you're not a young adult, you're just a young adult at heart, you can come to that worship night uh, here in the sanctuary, February 19th, 7.30 p.m. I believe we also are going to try and attempt to live stream that on our Instagram social accounts, and so you can try to watch it there as well. Lastly for today is our, uh, is our tithes and offerings, and since you're at home, obviously we can't pass the plate to you, but if you're able to do that, you can do that online by going to uh, a variety of places. One is right to our church webpage, and you go to the top right-hand corner and click on online giving and follow the instructions there, and it'll send that to us electronically. You can also go to your own banking institution's online platform, sign on, and send us uh, a check through them, or you can do it the old-fashioned way by sending it through the USPS mail or bringing it up here to the office Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. We are so grateful for your, uh, for your continued faithfulness and, and how this church has continued with their giving that has allowed us to do all these fun and exciting ministry programs, even when we're in this pandemic and things are kind of uh, a little bit crazy. So thank you for that. Well, my friends, we have come to see Jesus. We have come to worship him here today. And so we're going to bring up Dr. Jerry Kasberg for a message on First Thessalonians as we continue our preaching series, Preaching Through the Scriptures. Let's continue to worship. Thank you, Mike. You know, you may be familiar with the story of Jackie Robinson. Back in 1947, he was the first African-American to break into Major League Baseball. You may have seen the story from the movie 42. But being the first African-American in American 
uh, Major League Baseball, you can imagine the difficulties he ran into. The, the racial slurs, the condemnation, the city after city of being booed and people just angry that he was on the field. Well, he played for the Brooklyn Dodgers starting in 1947. And there's a story where they were playing a team in Cincinnati where a ball was hit to Jackie, who was on the first baseman, and he muffed the ball. He, he just couldn't get a handle on it. And the crowds went wild against him. And he said it was the moment of his greatest discouragement. He was ready to quit. But in that game and at that moment, the shortstop named Pee Wee Reese walked over to him. And in the midst of the crowd that was jeering and laughing and, and throwing those racial slurs, Pee Wee put his arm around Jackie Robinson. You see, Pee Wee was one of the most respected players of the game. And to top it off, he was a local favorite because he was from Kentucky. When he put his arm around Jackie Robinson, the crowd became still. There was a hush. Jackie Robinson would say in that moment, he was so encouraged, it changed the trajectory of his life. This morning, we're going to look at a book a uh, letter to the Thessalonians. And if there was one word to describe the letter to the Thessalonians, it would be encouragement. Encouragement is the, uh, the, the dictionary would tell us it's coming alongside someone uh, to teach, comfort, strengthen, or push them to act in a certain way. Someone once said this, what oxygen is to the body, encouragement is to the soul. And a man named William Arthur Ward wrote this, Flatter me, and I may not believe you. Criticize me, and I may not like you. Ignore me, and I may not forgive you. Encourage me, and I will not Forget you. Encouragement. I had an encouragement moment here about two weeks ago. A young man, well, not so young anymore, stopped in to see me. He was someone who uh, I knew long ago. He happens to be a paramedic uh, in a local fire department here. And... Uh, when I first met him, it was in 1977, almost 42 years ago. He has uh, become this paramedic, and, uh, but he was carrying a heavy weight. You see, he had not been able to save or make a difference in the lives of a number of children that they were called to on these emergency runs. And it weighed heavy on him. But he told me, he said, I want to thank you for all those years ago sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with me and sharing your very life as well. You see, back around 1977, he made a commitment to Jesus Christ. And one of the only things that carried him through these difficult times was that relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, before he left, we both prayed and there wasn't a dry eye between us. It was an incredible time of encouragement. And I so appreciate him, and it was so meaningful. As difficult as the conversation was, it was so meaningful and wonderful. 
Do you know what the Greek word for encouragement is? It's parakaleo. It comes from two words, para, alongside, and kaleo, to be called alongside. When we come alongside someone, we strengthen them, we encourage them, we uh, lift them up. It's an amazing thing that the word in the, for the Holy Spirit in the Bible is parakaleo. Do you know that word encouragement is used 105 times in the New Testament alone? It's what we are to do with each other. And if I had one word to describe Paul's letter to the church of the Thessalonians, this letter would be a parakaleo. It would be a letter of encouragement. But you may be surprised as we go through this, just who is encouraged. Before we go any further, let's pray that uh, the Holy Spirit would uh, take these words and encourage us. Join me in a prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, your powerful word. Open our eyes and our hearts to all that you have for us. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, may these words that are written on a page be written on our hearts that we might look more like you. If there would be anything that would keep us from hearing your words, your message, your encouragement this day, we pray that you would remove it. For we've come to see Jesus and to be changed by Jesus. In your son's name we pray, amen. Let me give you a little background to the Paul's letter to the Thessalonians because it's so important. You might remember that Paul's name was originally Saul. He was a Pharisee, and he had it in his heart to go and to wipe out this new sect out of Judaism called Christianity. Until one day on a road going to Damascus with papers to put people in jail and maybe even take their life, he encountered Jesus Christ. And Saul became Paul. And he not only had a call to be a missionary, but a, a very special kind of missionary. His mission was to take the gospel to non-Jewish people. Now, the disciples who followed Jesus, the apostles, they focused on the Jewish nation, that the Jewish nation would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But Paul's message, his, his ministry was to, to voice the good news of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, the non-Jews of the world. And if you know Paul's story, you'll know that he had three missionary journeys during his lifetime. Three times he set out to share the gospel to certain geographical areas. First going to the synagogue, but then going to the Gentiles in the area. Well, on Paul's second missionary journey, he had an idea that he wanted, that he was supposed to go to, to share the gospel in, in Eastern Asia. And he was on his way until one night in a dream, he, he saw a man from Macedonia, from the West, bidding him to come. And, and he sensed that God was directing him into a different in a different direction, to a different people group. And so instead of going where he thought to East Asia, he went west over toward Europe and went from Troas to a city called Philippi. And in Philippi, it, with this new call to go do this thing, he, he gets in trouble right at the get-go. And he gets thrown in jail with his uh, assistant, uh, missionary named Silas, and uh, they were thrown in prison, but they were beaten first. It was terrible. And you might know from the story from Sunday school that uh, the, during the night as they were singing hymns, uh, the gates opened, their shackles fell off, they didn't run, and the, uh, the jailer was surprised. And, 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 and so it kind of was the beginning of this church at Philippi, but because he was so hated in the town, he had to flee. 
and he went from town to town, and he comes to Thessalonica, and there he, he goes to the, to the synagogue and begins to talk to folks about Jesus. And the synagogue rulers become angry. And uh, after three weeks, just three weeks in Thessalonica, he is chased out of town. And he goes to the next town, Berea. And in Berea, those that followed him from Thessalonica, they chased him out of the town of Berea. So he makes his way to Athens, and when he gets to Athens, he has discussion with some of the philosophers of the day, and they make fun of him, and they basically laugh him out of town. And then he makes his way to a city called Corinth. Now, as he looks back over his journey, he is a broken man. He's been beaten and jailed. He's been hated. He's been chased out of town. He's been made fun of. Maybe it's one of the lowest times of his life. And he had the idea of sending Timothy, his young protege, another one of, of his disciples, to back to Thessalonica to check on the church. Timothy went and Timothy came back and brought an amazing message on how well, in spite of all the persecutions, how well the church was doing. And because of Timothy's report, Paul writes this first letter, probably of the New Testament, a letter of encouraging those that he couldn't, wasn't able to go visit, encouraging them with the gospel and in their new found faith. After he sent Timothy, he says, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought to us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted. We've been encouraged about you through your faith. For now we live, if you are standing fast in the Lord, it rolls our socks up and down. It changed Paul's perspective. It lifted his spirits. He was so encouraged. And they were faithful. And if you read the book, the text, you'll find out that the, the fame of this church was spread far and wide. Something very powerful was happening at the church of Thessalonica. Their faith and their growth was known throughout the land. How did this church not only survive in the midst of difficult times without its leaders, but how did it thrive? Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 4. For we know brothers loved by God. And when he says brothers, he's talking about brothers and sisters. He's talking about the family of God there. That he has chosen you. We know he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. The gospel came in word. I love that. I want you to know this is a powerful book. God's word is a powerful book. It's so powerful. Do you know it's outlawed in many countries around the world? When I was at a former church, Mandarin Presbyterian, we had teams of folks that would go from Florida to Cuba and we would smuggle Bibles in. Because we knew how powerful the word of God was. And it was worth the risk to get this word of God to the people of Cuba and people of China. This book, as we prayed earlier, is God's word. And the Holy Spirit takes these words that are written on our page and, and writes them on our heart's with such conviction that it changes our lives. 
Many of you watching this know what I'm talking about. Your life, when you heard, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you heard the word of, 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 of God and your faith came alive. There was conviction. You knew it was true. And everything changed. It's why we say Bethel Presbyterian Church is a biblical community. Because we have unity around the word of God. Because the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit is life changing. Life changing. Because the Holy Spirit writes these words on our hearts and it changes us. Transforms us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And then not only did they have conviction because of the Holy Spirit as the word of God was read. But they learned how to live their faith. Look what it says in 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example to all the believers. All the believers. In Macedonia. And in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in those places, Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. So we don't need to say anything to you. We don't need to even encourage you anymore because it is, it is overflowing from you into the northern kingdoms and the southern kingdoms. In these localities, how did they, how did they make such a difference? Conviction by the word of God, but they imitated. This word imitate comes from the word mikiel, which is to mimic, where we get the word. They mimicked Jesus Christ and they mimicked Paul, Silas, and Timothy on how they lived their lives. My friends, that is a key. If we can understand that, if we can understand the power that comes in having a conviction of the truth of this word, and then we imitate those who walk with the Lord, we imitate the Lord and those who walk with them, we become missionaries. We become life changers wherever we go. It's the key for the church today to be on this kind of mission for the Lord. So what did they mimic? What did they see? Well, notice the language that Paul uses. He talks about being like a mother and a father. And Listen to this. 1 Thessalonians 2. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very lives, our own selves as well, because you had become so dear to us. Like a mother, we nurtured you. But he goes on just a, a few verses later. For you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And then do you know what Paul says about them? In 1 Thessalonians 2.20, for you are our glory and our joy. As he, and he's talking about them as we would talk about our children as we are proud and how we love them. And then he goes on about the fact that they are brothers and sisters in Christ. And now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that is indeed what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. The mark of a follower of Christ is not how big a Bible they carry. 
or how big a cross that you wear on, uh, around your neck. But the mark of this Christian, the follower of Christ, is how we would love one another. And how they are loving, Paul's blown away by how they are loving even those who are afflicting them. Now here's what happened. The word came to them in power. They accepted it. They imitated Jesus and Paul. They cared for others, and then they shared the gospel. What a wonderful picture of what the church is, what the church should be, the call to all of our lives, to be cared for and hear the gospel, to accept it with deep conviction, to imitate those who walk with the Lord and our, imitate our Lord, and then to go share it with others. Now, we don't hear about this kind of Paul a lot because in his letters, he's, he's, he's reprimanding and trying to get the church back on track. But do you know who trained Paul in the ministry? A guy who's known in the New Testament, not by his real name, Joseph, but by his nickname, Barnabas. Do you know what Barnabas means? It means son of encouragement. The Apostle Paul was discipled, was trained by the son of encouragement, and he became a great encourager. He encouraged the Thessalonians, who by the way they responded and lived their lives, became an encouragement back to Paul, who was discouraged because it seemed that his ministry had hit wall after wall. They were his joy. They were his encouragement. I love the way that 16 years ago, I came here to Bethel, and I came wounded. And the one thing I tell every discovery class that you will find here at Bethel are folks who are great encouragers. I didn't have to come on a white stallion with new programs and, 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 and flashy this or flashy that. I, I just came and I was loved and encouraged. And I will always appreciate that about this church. And so I hope that when people outside these walls Think about Bethel Presbyterian Church. The word that comes to mind is a place of encouragement. Because there are so many churches that are tagged, characterized by judgment and distance. But Bethel is a biblical community that loves, lives, serves, and shares joyfully. Jesus Christ, that cares for all who walk in these doors and cares, hopefully, for all that we meet outside these walls. Are you an encourager? When people think of you, do they think, wow, I love being around them because I am so encouraged by them. What would your nickname be? Would you be encourager, helper, teacher, servant? Would people think of the word kindness when they think of you? Or would you be called grumpy or stingy? Would you be a, a gossiper? Would you be known as a critical person? You and I have the opportunity to encourage people. And the best way to encourage them is to put our life next to them, to hear their stories to give them strength and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to let them know that they are loved by God, 
that they were chosen before the foundation of the earth, that they were so loved that God sent his only son to give his life that they might have life. Might you and I be that kind of Barnabas to all that we meet? Will you, like Pee Wee Reese did, walk up to someone who is discouraged, who is lonely, who's feeling like an outcast or worthless? Will you walk up to somebody that the crowd is making fun of? Someone who's broken. Would you dare in front of everyone walk up and put your hand around them? Might you and I be that kind of encourager? May you and I this week think about the person who told us about Jesus Christ. Probably it wasn't a billboard or, or a track laying somewhere. My guess is, is that it was a person, a flesh and blood person who put their life next to yours, who gave you value by addressing you and hopefully in so many ways put their arm around you and told you about the God who loved you so much he left heaven's throne to come and give his life for you. May you and I continue the long history that we have here at Bethel of bringing the gospel to places. I love the fact that Bethel Presbyterian Church was the place that young life Columbus started in this, out of this sanctuary with the ministry of the Chilcotes and exploded across this land. I love the fact that out of some of the professors that went here that taught at Ohio State, InterVarsity sprang forth. And InterVarsity is at Ohio State because we wanted others to be cared for and to hear the gospel. And all the Campus Crusade folks who have come here and worshiped and been blessed, been encouraged. I am so grateful for our mission budget. As we encourage missionaries across the world, I, I am so thrilled for the ministries here at Bethel. Today we have a congregational meeting. We look back as to what God has done in the past, and we look forward to what God is doing in the future. May the word that rings forth from here is that we are encouragers in Jesus Christ to everyone we meet. Is that true for you? You think about that. Amen. Pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, I, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you for the way that the Holy Spirit has taken your word and convicted us of the truth that causes us to imitate you and others who have gone before us and how we love you and love others. And Lord, as we come to this table, prepare our hearts for all that you have for us. For this table is an encouragement, a reminder of your love, that your body was broken and your blood was shed for the forgiveness of all of our sins. May this table encourages us, encourage us as the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us and whispers through these elements as we take them in of your presence in our lives and the power that comes from that presence. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now as we, uh, we invite you to... Uh, uh, take hold of the communion set you perhaps have at home or to uh, take a piece of bread and a cup of juice as we share the Lord's Supper together this 
Uh, this is a dinner of encouragement. You see, Jesus was going to leave his disciples this night. And he headed, was headed to the cross, to his death and the resurrection, and leaving the church to them and the Holy Spirit. And he wanted to give them a, a meal of remembrance, a meal of encouragement. And so he took a loaf of bread and he said, this is my body. And it's broken for you. When you do this, do this in memory of me. In the same manner, he took the cup and he poured out the wine and said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. And the Apostle Paul reminds us that as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim Christ's death until he comes again. It is appropriate for you as you pass the the bread and the juice that you would remind each other of those words of institution that the body of Christ is broken for them and the blood of Christ is shed for them for the forgiveness of all of their sins. Jerry, the body of Christ is broken for you and the blood of Christ is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Mike, the body of Christ is broken for you. And the blood of Christ is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this meal, this meal of encouragement that reminds us of the length that you have gone so that we would be in a relationship with our Heavenly Father through your shed blood and broken body on the cross. We thank you for this tangible reminder. We thank you that we take these elements in, reminding us of your presence within us, that we might go forth and tell others. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now I would invite you to... Uh, to sit or stand where you are, and we will continue to worship God through the singing of this very special song. And now as you leave this place, may you leave encouraged 
by Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. May you be encouraged in your faith through the powerful word of God, through the presence of the Holy Spirit. May you be encouraged to live and imitate our Lord Jesus Christ and those that have gone before us. Those great saints are all around us. That the world might know the truth of the gospel. And that those we meet would be encouraged. That God would so love them. Go in peace to love and serve him. Amen.